Hi, I'm Art Bergeron. Do you have a financial plan? Is that a question that a lawyer should be even be asking you? Um, oftentimes I'm speaking to folks about things that they think that they want to talk to me about, about elder law. Um, but in many, in many cases, in addition to needing some elder law advice, they need to, the advice of some other folks so that they can actually develop a financial plan. Uh, as you know from seeing these presentations before, I'm always talking to my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, they've got three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Their goal is very simple. They, they love their house. They love their community. What, they want to live in their house till they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. It's all very straightforward. So the question is, how do they do that? Um, and if they're getting older, and in this presentation we're assuming that Frank and Mary are uh, 75 years old, um, how do they make sure that they don't run out of money before they die? How do they make sure that their life can kind of stay in balance? So these are difficult questions. Obviously they vary by person. Uh, so I'm going to use an example of, of Frank and Mary's situation. This may not be exactly yours, but I think you need to get the concept. So Frank, we're going to assume that Frank and Mary still own their house. They own it jointly. Uh, it's worth about $400,000. So they've got some joint savings worth about $200,000. Frank has an IRA worth $300,000. Um, so there's their total assets, $900,000. Uh, Frank has Social Security of $2,000 a month. Mary's is half of his, or $1,000 a month. So that's their situation. And when they're talking to me, they're talking to me typically about elder law related issues. And I'm telling them, well, there's some things you need to be careful about uh, going forward in terms of dealing with. Um, um, those kinds of issues, and we're going to talk about those a little bit. But there are a lot of things beyond that that go into figuring out, as far as Frank and Mary is concern, are concerned, how they can make sure that they don't run out of money. That they don't run out of money. They do not want to survive their money. So um, the question is, and once again, I'm just going to go back and, and look at these, these, uh, look at these figures. So Frank has, has it's a piece of this is to figure out what your real income is going to be, kind of projected. And then your expenses. So Frank's got $24,000 a year in income and Mary's got $12,000 a year in income. But then there are these other sources of income, the savings account and the, and the uh, IRA. So Frank every year is going to be required to take out a required minimum distribution. That starts, used to start when he was 70 and a half and now it starts when he's 72 and a half because that law changed a couple of years ago. Um, and so the required minimum distribution, and by the way, how did I get this number? By looking at the table. There is a social security table that tells you regarding the funds that you're holding in your uh, IRA or 401k for a particular year, how much money you need to be withdrawing. And the, the, the table is really based on some assumptions that, that, um, that the folks at the IRS make regarding your life expectancy, although they, sh they look at it as if your life expectancy were kind of longer than it really would be, your actuarial life expectancy. So, so in the case of, of Frank, who is 75 years old, um, they're assuming that this factor, the amount that they, you have to divide by, is this number, 22.9. And so if Frank has um, $300,000 uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, he is going to need to take out um, $13,100 during the year um, uh, in order to make sure that he doesn't suffer a penalty. Now once again he can always take more than that and we'll talk a little bit about that. He just doesn't want to be taking less. So this should really be added to his income. And remember this number changes every year. It's going to keep going up every year uh, as he gets older. Regarding savings, we're assuming that the interest rates are going to stay kind of where they are right now, which is really terrible, 1%. Now, I pro probably you can bank on the fact, if you're Frank and Mary, that over the next many years, that number is going to go up. It's not going to go down. So I think your interest rate right now is about the worst case interest rate. So we're assuming um, that their savings of $200,000 is earning 1% per year, uh, which means that um, in this year it's, it would generate another $2,000. Therefore, um, Frank and Mary's total income, if they were looking at it this year, is uh, $51,100. Now once again, um, they could always pull out more from their IRA uh, in order to, to, to use that. But I wouldn't, 
I never recommend this for clients unless you're really comfortable that you've got enough reserve. Because remember, the goal of Frank and Mary, our goal at this age, is to sleep well at night. And so you don't want to be putting yourself in a position where you're starting to lose sleep or thinking that in the future you might start losing sleep because you don't have enough in reserve. So the question is, will there be enough money? Now, a lot of times the answer of Frank and Mary, of many of my Frank and Mary clients is, well, I sure hope there is. Um, well, you know, hope is not a plan. And trust me, that little cloud that is kind of over your head of, no, oh, maybe I'm not gonna have enough, uh, is gonna keep getting bigger as you get older, uh, especially if you don't think you have enough. So rather than make building a plan based on hope, um, if you wanna really try to get a good night's sleep, then, want, then you wanna try to build a plan based on some real numbers. So let's look at those possibilities. So let's look at Frank and Mary's lifetime budget at age 75. So there were really two pieces to this. One is, what do you expect your budget is going to be if your current situation stays the same, right? And then, what are your reserves for contingencies, right? So, to start, we'll assume Frank and Mary want to stay in their house. You remember, that's their goal. They want to live in their house until they die. So, we're assuming that Frank and Mary's taxes, insurance, water, sewer, light, heat for this house is uh, $12,000 per year. Based on my experience is, with a house of about, that's worth about $400,000, this is about right. This is about right. You know, you're, you're uh, because you get, you're gonna get, you know, something off of your taxes because you're, you're, a, you're a senior, um, your, your water, and your, your, water uh, your, your light bill tends to not be really outlandish. So I think this is about, but once again, the point is, what's your number? Because if your number is way off, then maybe you need to think about a different housing arrangement. Uh, car, so you've got, you've got insurance, you've got gas, you've got repairs, and remember you want to build in depreciation because your car is going to wear out. Now it's not going to wear out as fast as it was when you were younger because you're not using it as much, but it is going to wear out. So assume that that's about 5,000 a year. Food, and now I'm assuming not the expenses when you're going out to eat, but just food at home. I'm figuring about $150 uh, a, a week, right? Um, I'm thinking about that because that's what about what we spend. My wife, my wife and I spend about $150 a week um, uh, times 52 weeks, so there's another $8,000. And then there's insurance. Once again, I'm, I'm assuming that there are no dramatic in, um, medical expenses here. Those are the kinds of reserves that you wanna kind of build in for. So I'm assuming Medicare, that, that they've got Medicare, but that they've got to pay their, uh, their Part D. Um, they're gonna have a Medicare, they've, they've, I'm assuming they've bought a Medicare supplement plan uh, to make sure that the deductibles or the co-pays that are built into Medicare Part B uh, are covered. Um, and, and, um, and then we're gonna make some assumption about their out-of-pocket cost for drugs. And I do wanna mention, once again, this is a number that you've got control over. Every year, you get to decide whether the package of things that you have, the combination of your regular Medicare, Medicare A and B, um, plus your Medicare supplemental insurance cost, plus your Medicare D cost, is higher than or lower than what it would be if instead you went to a so-called Medicare C plan, a Medicare Advantage plan, which is, is available just about every place. Unfortunately, not on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, but just about every place. Um, so you wanna, be, you, you wanna be evaluating this. You wanna talk to your doctor about this. You know, interestingly, your doctor can really affect your budget by may, may having you think about some of these possibilities. Um, and finally, there's fun. And obviously, you've got some flexibility on fun. Um, you wanna have a lot of fun, except that at least, if you're like me, if you're like me and my wife, your, your fun gets cheaper as you get older because it doesn't mean doing as much traveling, doing as much going out. You know, increasingly as we get older, your definition of really a lot of fun is a good night's sleep. So this number may even go down as you get older, but assume that you're building in the, this trip to Florida, you know, a trip to the Dunkin' Donuts, which is really two trips a day for me, for example, uh, trips to restaurants, to the gym, 
to Foxwoods. Some people love it, other people don't. The point is, only you know what is fun. And so you want to figure out, so how much fun do I want to have, right? And I'm assuming here that the amount of fun you want to have for the year is about $20,000, right? Which is, which, you know, which translates, um, you know, you div divide that by, by um, 50 weeks, that's about $400 a week for fun, right? And that's, that's not terrible, you know, because, you know, there are some weeks where you're not having a lot of expensive fun, and so you're kind of consolidating that for your vacation. So anyway, in Frank and Mary's case, their basic budget is in balance given the assets that they have. And once again, only you know what those assets are, and therefore only you know if any of this needs to be readjusted. Then, there's dealing with the unexpected. There are two kinds of big unexpected as far as Frank and Mary are concerned. There's the house, right? Because you just don't know. I mean, you know, you've got this great house, and you may or may not have been spending a lot of money to keep it up over the last number of years. Um, but you want to make sure that there's enough there for reserves, just in case, in case the roof blows off, in case there's a leak, in case the, the furnace goes, you know, n none of these house things are little things, right? And then you want to make sure that there's money there in case one of you isn't feeling great because you never want to be going to this nursing home. What you really want to be doing is you want to be staying at home. If you go to the nursing home, then that's kind of covered, and I'm going to talk about that at the end of the presentation. But if you're at home, um, if you're not feeling great, the cost of adapting your home in order to be able to stay at home and the cost of getting some home care so that if you're frank and you're not feeling great, Mary doesn't have to like kill herself taking care of you. You need to kind of factor that in. So there are a couple of places that you can go to figure out you know, where those extra funds are. One of them is your house and that's the, probably the best one. And you've heard me talk about these issues before. Um, the, you really have two options if you're older regarding using your home um, in order to take care of these unexpected emergencies. One of them is a so-called HELOC uh, or a home improvement or a, a home equity line of credit. Uh, and the other is a reverse mortgage. Both of them work the same way. And I think that it's really important to understand these are simply two versions of the same thing. In both cases, what you're doing is you're going to a lending institution a bank or reverse mortgage company, and you're saying, I want a line of credit. Uh, I want like a big credit card, and because it's a big credit card, it's gonna be secured by a mortgage on the house so that if I fail to pay it in certain situations, um, you, the, the bank or the financial institution, get to foreclose on the house, sell it to somebody, use the money to get paid back. So in the case of a HELOC, or in, in both cases, the, 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 the line of credit that you're getting, you're not spending anything on interest initially. You're not paying any interest on money that you haven't gotten. Uh, what both of these options give you is the ability to get money, at which point you've got, if you've gotten the money, at that point interest is going to start accruing. Now interestingly, the interest rates on HELOCs and reverse mortgages tend to be about the same. Uh, they're either, in either case you can, or in, in both cases, you can get, you can get a, a, um, a, um, uh, an adjustable option. Actually, in the case of the HELOCs, you can actually get a fixed rate option. Um, but the point is, you don't start paying interest until you've pulled out the money. Um, the difference between the two, there are a couple of differences. Um, the main one is that in the case of the HELOC, once you've started pulling out money, you have to start paying interest on it. Right? You, you're accruing interest, you still have to start paying the interest monthly. If you fail to make those monthly payments, that's a default. Bank gets to foreclose on the, um, on the HELOC. Uh, in the case of the reverse mortgage, that's not the case. In the case of the reverse mortgage, when you borrow money, whatever interest has accrued for that month um, is, is basically going to simply get added to the principal at the end of the month. And I'll just give you a quick example. If you borrowed $100,000, and your interest rate were 3%, your, your monthly interest on $100,000 at 3%, well, let's see, if, if the interest rate were uh, 12%, it would be $1,000 a month. So with 3%, it's a quarter of that. So it would be about, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be about $250 a month. So if you've borrowed $100,000, at the end of the month, you would owe the, the bank $250, but you don't have to pay them. What would happen would be instead, 
that interest, $250, would get added to the principal. So the following month, the interest would be based on $100,250. And obviously that number would, would, uh, would uh, um, gradually go up. So as a result, the total amount owed would gradually go up. In either case, in the HELOC case or the reverse mortgage case, if you die, the mortgage has to be repaid, right? Um, which means in either case, if you die, either your kids, if they want to keep the house, need to sell the house, um, or they need to remortgage at that point. But of course, at that point, they would be remortgaging. And so they'd probably be able to get a conventional mortgage in order to pay off the uh, reverse mortgage. And, but in either case, the, the, the amount that's being repaid is simply the amount that you borrowed plus the interest at the due with the date at the date that the mortgage has to be repaid. So either of these is a valid option. So, so, so there are the, a couple of other differences. The, the HELOC, typically this line of credit withdrawal period tends to be 10 years. And after that, the monthly payments start being based on starting to pay off some of the principal. In the case of the reverse mortgage, that extends until you die or until you move out of the house or obviously sell the house, but it, it, it extends until you die so that no payments ever need to be made while you're on, the, on the, uh, the reverse mortgage while you're alive. But the point is, only you know which one of these things is going to work, work better for you. Part of your planning needs to be to look at these options and to see whether right now you want to get one of these so that you know you have the money that's available if you need it. Um, so that's one. Second, dealing with your IRA. As we pointed out, there is a required minimum distribution uh, that would need to be taken every year. But your question, if you're Frank and Mary, is, is it worth taking more than that? Now, you want to talk to your accountant about that. I'm just saying, is it worth, instead of withdrawing, what, the like $11,000 that they were withdrawing, is it worth withdrawing $50,000 a year? Well, why in the world would you do that? Well, because of this, um, if you withdraw, in, 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 th these are the, the federal income tax rates applicable to a married, a married couple filing jointly in the, for the year 2020. Um, in, in this case, if your income, and remember the income um, is after you figured out your, deduct, your standard deduction and all that jazz, if your income is between zero and $19,000, your your, your ta federal tax that you pay on that money is only 10%. If your income is between $19,000 and $80,000, the, the amount, the percentage you're paying on that money is only 12%. If the income is more than, more than $80,000, look at that jump. Suddenly your tax rate jumps to 22%. So one of your strategies, if you're Frank and Mary, if you're Frank, is you may decide, well, you know, I'd rather be taking this money out Assuming that I'm going to use it during my lifetime, that I may use it during my lifetime, it probably makes a lot more sense for me to take it out gradually during a year when I'm paying either 10 or 12 percent rather than waiting for an emergency, which is the moment where I would be using this money. Because remember, what we're saying here is this money is really designed to take care of an emergency, right? Um, rather than taking it out in an emergency where I'm paying 22 percent on some of the money because I'm taking it out all at once. Now, once again, this is, this, is a, this is a question for you to talk about with your accountant, right? And that's, the and that's the point. The point of this kind of planning is you want to talk to your lawyer because your lawyer is aware of some issues, but only some. <clears throat> what you really need is kind of a combination of your lawyer, your accountant, and probably a financial person. One of two kinds, either a money manager uh, or a financial planner. Uh, many financial planners also do money management, some don't. Um, when you're trying to figure out, and, and so this is really regarding your, 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 both for your IRA and for your other money, right? And so what you're trying to balance when you're doing this kind of, uh, this kind of analysis is one, safety, right? That's the, the market versus the mattress, you know? Um, obviously you put it under the mattress, you don't even have to worry if the bank fails. It's under the mattress, except, boy, you're not getting much of a rate of return in terms of what your income is going to be every year. Um, if you're putting it in the stock market, well, you know, it's gone up for a long time and it may continue, but of course it doesn't always go up and we've, we've all had the experience of that. 
Um, so you want um, flexibility. You want the ability to withdraw money in a pinch. And you may want to talk to your lawyer about that, about times you may want to withdraw money. And finally, you want tax minimization. We were just talking about that in the case of the IRA. You always want to be kind of figuring that out. So once again, going back to Frank and Mary's situation, remember their savings are 200,000, their IRA is 300,000 for a total of 500,000. Um, their return on that savings um, is going to be uh, 1%. Um, it, it is, it, it, excuse me, if they, if, 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 suppose all of this money were, were getting a return of 1% because they're being very conservative. They've got their IRA at the bank, they've got their, their CD at the bank. So if they're getting 1% return, that's $5,000, right? Uh, if they were getting a 5% return, that would be $25,000. If it's under the mattress, that's zero, right? So in, in our example, we're kind of, we're, not, we're, we're making some assumptions about the cash that it's just in the savings account. I wasn't making any assumptions about the IRA, but the point is, this is a place where you can really increase the quality of your life without, using, without dipping into principal. It was just really by looking at these funds. So for example, if you hire an asset manager, a person who's gonna actually manage your money um, it, as opposed to just having the bank manage your money, which is really what's going on when there, it's in a savings account. Management, typically the asset manager's management fee is gonna be 1%. Suppose though that as a result of that management fee, he's getting you a 5% return on assets on which you were getting a 1% return. All of a sudden, you're netting out an extra $20,000, right? So, um, you want to talk to folks, you want to talk to your accountant, you want to talk to a money manager to see what works, to see if that's a better alternative for you. Because your money manager doesn't necessarily need to be putting that money into stock, doesn't need to be high risk. But the point is you have to have that conversation with that person. Um, annuities. Annuities who, which, are, who, which are typically sold by financial planners. Um, but all, but it, it, as opposed to money managers who are really managing your money as an ongoing basis. What's the advantage? The good news of an annuity. There's no tax on the money that you put in until you take it out. That's terrific. Typically on an annuity, there's a feature that has some kind of guaranteed annual rate of return. So it's actually similar to what you're doing with the bank. You know, you're, if, if you're buying CDs, you're leaving the money parked there and the, and the bank is, is using the money to do things, and in return for that, they're paying you a fixed amount. So if you're Frank and Mary, you may decide, well, you know, as opposed to having the money just parked in a savings account earning 1%, or having my IRA parked earning very low, perhaps I should convert it into an annuity, and that may be great. The bad news, though, right, is that when the money comes out, the money gets taxed at ordinary income rates. It doesn't get taxed at capital gains rates, even if the money that were being used by the annuity company were put into stock. So, so there may be that there's a disadvantage. And finally, and don't forget this, there may be a penalty for early withdrawal. So if for some reason you need all of your money early, um, you may be paying a stiff price for the fact that you've gotten this, this guaranteed annual return. So once again, this is something you have to balance out. But you can't figure this out. You don't figure this out by, you know, talking to your buddies at the Dunkin' Donuts. You talk, you, you, you maybe, unless if they're really good, but you really figure it out by, by talking to your accountant, talking to a financial person, talking to your lawyer. So there are a number of different tools that you can use to invest your money. One of the things that I'm just going to, to, to kind of um, mention or focus on, though, is remember, Financial advisors who are selling you things, who are selling you annuities or other products, their pay is typically a commission based on what they're selling you. So you need to be aware of that. You may, have to, you may want to ask them how much they're getting in a commission based on the products that they're going to sell you. And you want to talk to your accountant about taxes. Finally, just a few minutes about Frank and Mary and MassHealth, because this is what really relates to your need for flexibility. Um, say, you know, so you know what Frank and Mary's assets are. Um, if one of them needed nursing home care, if one of them, say Mary needed nursing home care, or excuse me, say Frank needed nursing home care, what he would want to do to qualify, once he was in the nursing home, he would want to qualify for MassHealth. Once he's on MassHealth, 
uh, he would pay his pension and social security to the nursing home, Mass Health would pay all the rest. If he were in that situation, he could qualify for Mass Health almost immediately by doing these things. He can shift all of his assets to Mary. Contrary to public, often public perception, there is no penalty regarding transfers between spouses. There's no so-called five-year look-back period that would apply. So he can immediately shift assets to Mary. Mary could keep up to $100,000 in those assets, I'm estimating, because Mary can own the house. If, for Frank to qualify for Mass Health, Mary can own the house. Mary can have up to about $129,000 in cash or cash equivalent assets and can have unlimited income. So what Mary would do in this situation, Frank would shift all of the assets to Mary. Now the home would be non-countable. Mary would have more than that $129,000. She'd have $500,000. And we would advise her at that point, keep about $100,000, use the remaining money to buy an annuity. As long as it's an annuity that pays over monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Mary's life expectancy, buying that annuity converts the asset into an income stream. Mary's allowed to have infinite income and therefore she's safe. The problem though is, um, do, does, does, do, does any of this stuff violate any, do, if you're pulling out, if you've got an annuity, do you need to pay a penalty, right? If you've got a, a HELOC, by the way, or if you've got a, um, a uh, that then, or if you've got a reverse mortgage, then pulling money out of that, those funds in order to pay for any of um, uh, Frank's care, there's no penalty to that. But you want to make sure if you've got to transfer this IRA money that you're probably going to be paying some kind of a penalty to cash in the IRA. If you're, if you're going to be cashing in the annuity, you're probably going to be paying a penalty for that. And so what you want to factor into your planning is not just the rate of return of these things, but are you, going to, are you going to need the money? If you need the money in an emergency, are you going to pay a big penalty for it? Finally, summary, get a plan. Don't just spend your time losing sleep over this. Get some professional advice. Talk to your doctor about Medicare, Medicaid, and those options. Or excuse me, Medicare, the Medicare supplement, Medicare D. Talk to your lawyer. Talk to a money manager. Talk to your accountant. Stay flexible and stay safe. Stay flexible and stay safe. If you're not sleeping well, do something. That's the goal. The goal of life at our age is to get a good night's sleep. If you've got any further questions on any of this, um, you, can, you can see this, this, um, this presentation on our YouTube, um, pay, our YouTube channel, Frank, Frank, Elder Law Frank and Mary, uh, or you can call me. I'd be happy to talk to you. I never charge for advice. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much.